Hi, thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Uh, this is the Michael J. Fox Foundation's Hot Topics webinar series, and uh, today we'll be uh, talking about the role of genetics in Parkinson's disease. Uh, so thanks again for everybody for joining. Uh, so my name is Brian Fisk, and I'm uh, Vice President of Research Programs here at the Foundation, uh, and I'm going to be joined today on our panel by uh, um, two colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrew Singleton and uh, Ms. Elise Bindick. Uh, Andy is uh, Chief of the Molecular Genetics Unit at the National Institute on Aging, uh, which is a division of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and Elise is a Certified Genetic Counselor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. So welcome to both of you. Thanks. Um, I'm, also, I'm also excited to uh, introduce our moderator for the day, uh, Dave Iverson, uh, who I've worked with many times uh, before. Uh, in addition to his day job as a producer, writer, and correspondent for public broadcasting, Dave is actually uh, MGFF's um, contributing editor uh, and who has been moderating our webinar series here. Uh, he also um, has been helping us out on a number of our research roundtables as well. Um, he's also a member of our patient council. Um, anyway, before handing uh, the reins to Dave, uh, I'd just like to quickly thank uh, a couple of our generous sponsors, um, Medtronic, DBS Therapy, and Merck, uh, who are supporting our 2013 Hot Topic series. Uh, I should also note that Merck is an uh, uh, industry supporter of our Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative, which is a big landmark clinical study uh, that we've been supporting to find promising markers of Parkinson's disease progression. So um, we're very thankful to their support. Uh, so with that, I'm going to quickly now turn it over to Dave Iverson to uh, lead us through today's topic. Uh, Dave. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Andy and Elise. Uh, for being part of our conversation today. And thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us for this um, webinar. It's a fascinating topic and probably an area of Parkinson's research that has represents more change than perhaps anything else. It was not so very long ago that we didn't really think there was any genetics uh, component of the disease. Um, by way of personal example, I remember when my father was had part, when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, talking with his neurologist, who was a fine fellow and gave my dad great care, him assuring me um, that there was nothing to worry about in terms of the rest of the family because they knew then that Parkinson's was not genetic. Well, lo and behold, years later, my brother was diagnosed and, and then I was as well. So our understanding has grown uh, tremendously over the past decade and it represents a, a really fascinating area of, of further research but also a complicated one. And so by way of getting us started, I thought I'd just read you. I looked up what the actual definition of a gene is, and this is what I found. It is a locatable region of genomic sequence corresponding to a unit of inheritance which is associated with regulatory regions, transcribed regions, and or other functional sequence regions. Now, I don't know about all of you, uh, but with the exception of probably Andy, Brian, and Elise, it, that may have sounded a bit mysterious. So what we want to try to do over the course of the next hour is give us a much better working understanding of what genes are and how they play a key role in, in uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. So let's get started. Um, uh, we want to... Um, uh, be able to give you a better understanding of uh, what uh, genes are. And so we just have this first slide. And, and Andy, why don't you get us started? Because these are the sort of obvious things we think about with genes, eye and hair color. But then as we work our way down, we also see that they can lead to a predisposition to certain diseases. So give us your best understanding of how we can understand the key role that genes play in our makeup and in our various health orientations. Sure, sure. I thought your I actually thought your description of a gene was very good. I was going to lead off with the <laughs> same thing. Um, so, you know, genetics is is it, it gets a lot of press, but I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of general misunderstanding about the role of genetics, and our view has matured over the years. So I think it's kind of useful to think about what is a gene, what is a genome. So. We have about 20,000 genes uh, contained in our genome, and our genome is very, very, very large. It's a collection of individual letters that, that make up these genes, about 3 billion in total, which is a, a huge number. Um, it's, it's a kind of a, such a large number, it's hard to, it's hard to, to uh, conceptualize, but you can imagine that if your job was to, to write the genome down letter by letter, and you did that job 
for eight hours a day, five days a week, all year, it would take you about 200 years to complete that job. So it's just absolutely massive amount of information that contains these 20,000 genes. So a, a gene is something, and the genome is something that is passed on from uh, parents to child. So you, you get kind of half of your genome from your mum and half of your genome from your dad. And by and large, your copy, your half that you get from your mother or your father is identical to their copy. There is some mutation as it's passed on, some changes occur as it's passed on, but, but by and large, it's pretty much, pretty much the same. You, you can think of the genes as the hard wiring for how our cells respond to anything and everything. So they're kind of the instructions for the cell uh, to tell it how to respond to a stimulus or to tell it what to do as the cell ages, things like that. So it, the, the genome is not something that uh, influences you in isolation. It, it influences uh, your cells and you as a whole um, as a part of your environment and in, in, in with your environment. Um, Genetics isn't as simple as we once thought. So, you know, I remember going to school and hearing that uh, uh, there was one gene for eye color. If, uh, if you carried a certain copy, you'd have brown eye color. If you carried a different copy, you'd have blue eye color. What we've learned over the years is actually that's much more complicated. Now we know there's lots of genes for eye color, and that's mirrored what we've known about disease. Our early investigations into genetic forms of disease really focused on rare familial diseases, things that were passed on from parent to child and, and that you invariably got. If you were the, if you were the child of, of a parent with a disease, you had a 50% chance of getting that or a 25% chance of, of getting that disease, very high kind of uh, transmission rate. So that's been very useful. Studying those kind of genetic forms of disease has been incredibly useful. But our view has matured over the years to start to look at genetic aspects of disease that aren't necessarily obviously passed from, from parent to child. And I, I think that so that's... One of the, uh, sorry to interject, Andy. So it's, it's one of the key things for us to start, just to lay the groundwork for our longer discussion here, um, that, that we're talking about a continuum of possibilities, that there isn't one trigger, but there are many triggers working in combination with each other. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. And, you know, traditionally we've been very good at looking at, uh, at, at finding genetic causes of disease, you know, where a single mutation causes a disease. In the last five or six years, we've gotten better at finding risk factors, but there's clearly going to be things in between uh, mild risk factors and, and causal genes. So let's look at um, uh, some of the different associations that we know about with Parkinson's. As Andy was commenting, there are a number of, of mutations and uh, genes that, that are involved in Parkinson's, and we're going to work our way through these. This is sort of like peeling the layers of the onion, those that have a direct causal effect and those for which there are some associations. And I want to start our conversation with this part and, and, and have you, Elise, help us understand um, mm -hmm. this question of whether or not you will, will get something, um, whether or not these, these genes cause it if you just get one pair or two pairs. There's this, you'll see on mm -hmm. the slide here, auto, uh, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. Help us understand what that exactly means because, again, just the fact that you might have one parent with the disease doesn't necessarily mean that automatically you will too. Sure, and you make a very good point. So when we talk about the inheritance, the mode of inheritance for these different conditions, you frequently see autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and then for the susceptibility genes, they're going to be often autosomal dominant with reduced penetrance. So kind of some analogies that we use to help um, explain those to patients. So. Autosomal recessive is kind of like if you had a horse-drawn carriage. So when you have two horses drawing the carriage, everything goes fine. If you then only have one horse drawing the carriage, everything still goes fine. So that's the situation where someone is a carrier for one mutation in a gene that has autosomal recessive inheritance. So it's only when two people who are carriers pass on their gene change with a mutation to their child and then the child would have two non-working copies of a gene. 
So that would be the case then of the carriage with no horses. So it's not going to be functional. Now, with autosomal dominant conditions, um, that's more like a bike. So we know that if you have a bike and you have one flat tire, you're not going to be able to use that bike. So the way that's similar to autosomal dominant conditions is, is because you have two copies of a gene with just one copy having a mutation in it, it's enough to cause uh, the disease. Now, when you get into susceptibility genes, kind of use that, um, you know, you talk about susceptibility genes, protective genes, and environmental factors. That's kind of the area of the complex um, Parkinson's disease, and that's the majority of what we see. Um, because again, rarely will you see um, the rare forms that are caused by the, the autosomal dominant and the autosomal recessive genes that have been discovered so far. So, and, and just to add into that further, Elise, it's also mm -hmm. true that if you inherit, for example, one of these mutations, some of them, like the LERC2 mutation, mm -hmm. Even if you get that mutation, not all of these genes are necessarily automatic in terms of whether or not you'll get the disease. Exactly. So for LARC2, I kind of describe that as having a slow leak in one of your tires. So you're not necessarily always going to end up with getting Parkinson's disease. You might be able to get from point A to point B, and having that slow leak will never have any effect. Um, but say if there are certain other risk factors present, there could be other uh, susceptibility genes that can increase your risk as well, cause that leak to be more uh, stronger, or environmental factors. Say you're not on a smooth road, but you're on a rocky road. That can make your tire go flat sooner. And then you throw in the aspect of protective genes. So, um, you know, if you picked up a, a nail or something, a protective gene might be something like akin to a patch on that area. So that's kind of the way that you can see there's a, a, a broad interaction between uh, susceptibility genes where likely you need other risk factors to be present because not everyone who has one of those susceptibility genes is going to go on to develop disease. And Brian Fisk, we're learning more and more about these different genes and we keep identifying more and more um, genes that are in play when it comes to Parkinson's. Give us sort of the overview of how that is beginning to change the research field and the way in which we're learning the, about more about the interplay between the, the, the genes and the environment and how this is beginning to reshape the Parkinson's research field overall. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're raising a really sort of interesting point where, you know, I think historically um, we tended to think of Parkinson's not really as a genetic disease, and certainly in its, you know, the first, you know, number of decades that people were studying it, people assumed it was caused by, you know, something maybe environmental, something else, something non-genetic. You, know, we, we, you know, we certainly knew it was sometimes found more commonly in families uh, in, in certain cases, but, um, you know, I think people tended to think it was, you know, through some sort of shared exposure to an environmental, you know, toxin or something like that. So it really wasn't until the late 90s where the first real genetic mutation in Parkinson's disease was, was discovered in a gene called alpha-synuclein. And so that really, I think, just kind of opened the floodgates and realized, people realized that, you know, there really are uh, potentially ways that we could uh, identify genetic causes of Parkinson's. And over the several years that happened after that initial discovery, a number of other genes were discovered. Uh, where mutations were also uh, explaining um, Parkinson's in, in certain rare cases. So I think what you what you saw was uh, you know a kind of revolution, if you will, in our genetic understanding of the disease. So that obviously helped us to you know explain some some um, forms of the disease. But what it really provided, I think, as a, a sort of a revolutionary idea was. Um, really helping to identify biological pathways that were messed up, if you will, non-functional or not functioning as well as they should be in people with Parkinson's. And that for uh, when you're thinking about how to develop drugs for Parkinson's disease is really key because that gives you sort of clear sort of biological mechanism that you can go after with a potential drug to try to try to correct that. And that's where genetics was really able to, uh, you know, act essentially as signposts pointing to those uh, potential pathways. So that, that leads us into the next thing that we want to talk about because Andy Singleton, if you look at genetics one way, those mutations that we just showed on the previous slide, 
those account for a relatively small percentage of, of Parkinson's disease, a couple of percentages, two to four, something like that in that range as I understand it. But something I know you've talked about in the past is that if you look at it more broadly, there's a genetic component to perhaps almost everybody who has Parkinson's. Explain what you mean by that and why then this understanding of something that seemingly seems rare actually could provide us, as Brian was just suggesting, a much broader understanding of how the disease actually works. Sure. So, you know, I think the, you can think of there being two broad reasons why we why we pursue this kind of genetics work, and Brian's touched on these already. Um, one is to to really understand the processes that lead to disease. What are the molecular processes that, that lead to disease so that we can effectively try and develop therapeutics against those processes so that we can have a therapy that's against the underlying cause rather than the symptoms. Another reason for doing genetics is to try and determine who's at, who's at risk. Can we start to develop uh, some prediction of who will get disease and, 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 uh, and who won't? We talked earlier about there being kind of a continuum of genetic contribution in disease. So you have these fairly rare cases, certainly in the general population, um, that are essentially caused by carrying a mutation. If you carry the mutation, you're probably going to get disease. But at the other end of the, the spectrum, we know that there are tens, twenties, maybe even a hundred genetic variants that are very common that um, all of us will carry some of these that increase your risk a small amount. So understanding um, how those exert an effect on the process that leads to Parkinson's disease will also tell us about um, you know, PD and perhaps direct us towards points of therapeutic intervention. What, what and, we're learning... And, and, sorry, go yep. ahead. Well, what we're, what we're learning as we start to, to tie together these very rare familial forms and the genes that are involved in the, in, the, in the common kind of typical Parkinson's disease forms is that some of the genes are associated in both, both forms. So synuclein carries mutations that invariably cause disease, but it also carries very common variability that just increases your risk for disease a small amount. So it really suggests that these familial forms, certainly some of these familial forms, um, follow the same pathway as typical disease. We'll be digging more into this nuclein question in, in just a moment, but I want to just underline what you just said, and it's sort of in the, the lower left block on the slide that's before everyone on their computers, which is that the, the bet we're making here, and tell me if it's more than a bet, is that there is a, sh there is a shared common denominator between genetically prompted disease and disease and the, and the sort of everyday garden variety version of, of Parkinson's, and that if we understand that underlying mechanism within how it's working genetically, that will tell us, that will, that will give us a lesson that will apply more broadly to other forms of, of, of Parkinson's. Is that right, that the, the, the underlying rules are the same? Yeah, that's that was certainly the uh, the bet we were making, and in the in the late 90s, you know, it, it, we weren't sure that that was true. Was synuclein a, a really good gene to to go after? Um, evidence is, is is really building now, and I would say is is extremely compelling that studying some of these rare familial forms, perhaps not all, but some of these rare familial forms gives us a great deal of insight about the, the regular form of Parkinson's disease. So I think, I think the bet is paying off. So let's take a look at two examples, and then in about 10 minutes, we're going to start taking all of your questions. So if you have um, a question you'd like to pose, and we're already getting lots of great questions from a, a variety of people um, about, these, about how this works in Parkinson's, uh, do send them in to us, and in about 10 minutes, we'll start taking as, as many of your questions as we can. So we want to dive into two uh, mutations in particular that are the focus of a lot of research, and we're going to start with one called LARP2, which is the greatest known genetic contributor uh, to Parkinson's uh, disease. And um, uh, Brian Fisk, um, one of the things that makes this interesting, I want to start with the bottom bullet point, um, is that this is something that, that the Fox Foundation is um, eager to pursue in part because 
it is something that appeals to make, to drug makers because it's a more obvious target. I mean, some of what's hard with Parkinson's disease is that it's so complicated. But this gives you something that you can aim at more directly. Explain what that means and why this is so important in terms of making sure we get the drug companies interested in developing new possible breakthroughs. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I, I think the the LERC2 example, I think, is a, a particularly compelling one when you sort of look at the general problem of how do you translate a genetic sort of discovery into actual treatments for patients. And in this particular case, you know, we when we first, or when the field first um, discovered, I should say, uh, Dr. Singleton was one of the groups who actually discovered the mutations in, in LERC2 initially in Parkinson's. Um, and when you first discover something like that, one of the first things you want to do is look at that gene and try to understand, do we know anything about what that gene um, codes for in the cell. So basically genes, you know, tell the cell what types of proteins to make. And so in this case, the LERC2 gene tells the um, cell what type of LERC2 protein to make. Uh, and so we wanted to know what the LERC2 protein does. And very fairly quickly, people were able to uh, hone in on the fact that one of the things the mutation in that LERC2 gene seems to cause is for that protein uh, which is actually has an enzyme function in the cell normally, uh, to have, be a little bit overactive. And so that overactive enzyme function uh, gave us a clue that that may actually cause, at least in these uh, families, Parkinson's disease. And so um, when we explored that a little bit further, we realized the type of enzyme that it was was actually a type of enzyme that many drug makers have been making drugs against for many years. It's a type of enzyme called a kinase, and that's sort of a fancy term for basically a type of enzyme that chemically modifies other proteins in the cell in a, in a specific way. Um, and so what we were what companies were very quickly able to do is to, you know, take this, you know, essentially this LERC2 idea to their chemists uh, in the lab and say, hey, can you make a drug against this uh, LERC2 enzyme activity? And for most of those chemists, they're like, yeah, we've been doing that essentially for the cancer field for many years. It's actually relatively simple to do. And so we saw a huge, huge interest in companies uh, essentially jumping on the LERC2 gene uh, to try to develop um, essentially inhibitor compounds that can actually inhibit that enzyme activity for LERC2. So it was a great, great example where um, a genetic mutation uh, that, we, uh, that was identified clearly pointed to a potential biological impact on the, on the protein that that gene coded for, uh, and that very quickly led then to industry um, trying to develop drugs for it. So I think it was a great example of this. And, and Brian, how close are we to having something that is would be in clinical trials that would be close to being available uh, that could fix um, the LERC2 problem? Yeah, so I mean, we're definitely you know looking at it purely from a chemistry problem. I think we're getting close. We actually a number of companies I think have you know and have patented uh, you know in the public uh, domain. Um, LERC2 inhibitor compounds, and so I think we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, movement in that space. I think where the challenge is right now in the LERC2 sort of drug development space is more, um, has more to do with sort of broader issues around how best you design a trial to test the LERC2 inhibitor in, you know, what's the population you use, do you only use people who have the LERC2 mutation, or do you try to try it out in, you know, which is still a relatively small number of people, or do you try it out in all Parkinson's cases, uh, you know, what are the types of biomarkers you would use in that trial design. So a lot of these sort of more um, sort of thornier issues that frankly have maybe less to do with LERC2 specifically and more to do with just how do you move uh, a therapeutic like that into clinical trials. So I would say we're, we're very close uh, chemically, uh, sort of from the drug development side, but uh, I think we still have some hurdles uh, when it comes to actually designing that trial. And let's look at one more um, uh, mutation, um, and then we'll start uh, taking in um, all your, your questions. This has to do with something called um, alpha-synuclein, um, which, as the slide indicates, is a rare inherited form of Parkinson's. But this, again, Andy Singleton, is where the link between something rare may tell us something that applies more broadly, because synuclein is this uh, protein that tends to clump up in Parkinson's in the brain of someone with Parkinson's. In fact, it's if you in, uh, upon autopsy, it's the it's the it's what tells you whether or not someone had Parkinson's is if there's all these sticky clumps of this protein called synuclein in the brain. There's a rare mutation that 
that prompts that. And tell us again what we're learning about that and, again, what that may tell us more broadly about a way that in time we could help bust up that overabundance of synuclein in the brain of someone with Parkinson's. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, you know, mutations in synuclein were the first ones identified as a, as a cause of Parkinson's disease. And you're right, it's a, a very rare familial um, familial cause. Uh, the the protein that's encoded by this gene is also called alpha-synuclein. And again, if you don't have that protein accumulating in your brain, you don't have Parkinson's disease. It's part of, it's part of the criteria for, for diagnosing the disease. What we've learned since the initial discovery of the, of the mutations, which kind of changed the, the sequence, they changed the quality of the protein, is that there are also rare mutations that change the quantity of the protein that lead you to produce too much alpha-synuclein, and this, this causes disease. These are, again, uh, rare mutations. So this really led to the hypothesis that if we can reduce synuclein, maybe that's a viable therapeutic. And that's been pursued for several years. Most recently, I would say in about 2008 or so, um, we discovered um, as, a, as a field that not only do rare uh, mutations in synuclein cause disease, but that there are common variants close to synuclein which increase your risk for disease. And these seem to also increase your risk by increasing the amount of synuclein that's produced, not by doubling it or trebling it, but by increasing it by 10 or so this, this protein is, is really quite special in, in, in Parkinson's disease, not only because it was the first one found to be mutated, uh, not only because it's uh, uh, the pathological hallmark of disease, but because we know that there's genetic variability across all forms of Parkinson's disease that influences your, your risk at synuclein. And so, Andy, if we get a greater understanding of what's goes awry in the in this rare form of mutation again the fundamental question will that help us come up with something that could reduce the problem of synuclein accumulation in the brain for anyone with parkinson's well i mean of course that's certainly the hope um, we've known about synuclein for a long time we still don't quite know um, what it does but uh, we suspect that lowering it or uh, trying to clear it from the cell might be a great um, a therapeutic avenue, and there are certainly um, companies pursuing that avenue. Okay, let's move into uh, all of your questions because we have tons, and I want to make sure we can get to as, as many as um, we can. Um, there are a number of questions like this one uh, coming in uh, from Marjorie. And Elise, um, why don't you get us started with a response to this question. Uh, Marjorie uh, writes in, um, my mother has Parkinson's. My brother was just diagnosed. Um, I have some smell loss, but I haven't been diagnosed. What should I do? OK. so. In families like this, so what we see is there's um, two generations that appear to be affected, her mother and then her father, but it remains at two people in the entire family. So you're kind of on the cusp of is this something going on that appears to be autosomal dominant because she seems to have some features as well herself. Now, I would always recommend whenever you have any questions about what your genetic risk is, to speak with um, someone for to have genetic counseling. And that can be someone who has expertise in the area, such as a genetic counselor or a geneticist. And if genetic testing seems like something that might be indicated in the family, they're going to work with you to make sure that you make an informed decision as to whether testing is right for you. So, um, it's a really great point because, it, it, just to interject, Elise, it's such a good point because sometimes, you know, even when you get a test, you might get a result that says you're four times more likely, but then you realize, well, that might mean if my odds are 1%, if, my four, if I'm four times more likely than the average, well, now my odds are 4%, which are not necessarily mm -hmm. four times more seems like a ton, but 4% doesn't. So it's really important to put all of these questions in context. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, so in case people aren't familiar with what genetic counseling involves, what they do is they review your medical family history with you, 
and they look for any red flags that might indicate that your family could fall into one of the categories where the Parkinson's disease might be caused by one of those rare um, genes that has a always is a deterministic gene and will always result in Parkinson's disease, or if your family history is more likely to have um, the combination of the susceptibility genes and environmental factors. And then they can talk with you if you fall into one of those groups, this genetic testing might be informative because, again, only about 10% of Parkinson's disease will have an identifiable underlying cause. If, now, I, if I can jump in, I think that, oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, no, I was going to just interject a little bit because I think that's, uh, that last point is, is important, and I've, I've just noticed from, you know, speaking with, with different uh, individuals as well, the sort of confusion that, um, say, you get genetically tested and you don't have one of those sort of common, one of those mutations that we've listed on, on the slides here, does that necessarily mean you don't have, won't have a genetic risk for Parkinson's? And I think that the confusion there is that, uh, and Andy sort of alluded to this as well, that there probably still are a number of other sort of genetic um, uh, contributions to Parkinson's that we haven't discovered yet. So even though we've only really discovered maybe, you know, genes that explain maybe sort of 10 percent or so of, of the possible genetic contribution to Parkinson's, there still may be a lot more genetic contributions. So I think it's, a, it's you know, easy to say if you get genetically tested and you have one of those mutations that that may explain your Parkinson's, but if you don't have one of those mutations, that doesn't necessarily tell you, tell you very much right now. Let me get to a couple more of our, our questions. Um, Here's one of Brian that maybe you can can field. Um, uh, should people who have different genotypes or different genetic propensities for Parkinson's get different treatments? Um, I, I suspect the answer is we don't know enough yet to know the answer to that. But is is do treatments vary based on whether or not the Parkinson's you have has a direct genetic connection or not? Um, great question, yeah. So, so it, it depends on the type of treatment we're really talking about. So obviously for Parkinson's, um, if you are talking about just sort of treatment for your symptoms, uh, you know, since in Parkinson's most of those symptoms are due to a loss of dopamine-producing cells in your brain, uh, whether you have the genetic form that causes those cells to die or some other, you know, uh, form uh, of Parkinson's that causes those cells to die, you know, the uh, dopamine replacement therapies could still work for, for all of those individuals. So, so those types of treatments should, should be probably the same. Uh, I think where it gets interesting is when you start looking at the different types of Parkinson's explained by potentially genetics and whether or not sort of disease targeting therapies, so these are therapies that are really trying to target the underlying cause of the disease, whether those might actually have to be tailored to the individual. And so you could imagine in a case where, say, someone is a carrier of, you know, LERC2 mutations, uh, would that LERC2 type of inhibitor drug we talked about before really only work in those individuals versus, say, someone who had uh, a mutation in the alpha-synuclein gene that caused their, you know, particularly caused their alpha-synuclein protein to clump up, you know, more aggressively than, than normally. So, I mean, and would that person then have a different type of underlying, you know, mechanism for the disease that you would want to treat differently. So it's, a, it's an area that um, companies, uh, drug companies, are really looking into and trying to understand, obviously from a sort of traditional um, uh, business model for many companies. The idea is you want the blockbuster drug, you want the Viagras, you want the, uh, you know, uh, uh, statin drugs that everybody will use to, to uh, treat their uh, particular problems. But uh, we're finding more and more as we deal with complex diseases that we might actually need to be a little bit more personalized in that treatment approach. And so I think companies are struggling, I think, both from a business side, but also I think scientifically to understand how they can, can offer those types of um, tailored uh, uh, treatments. So it's such a, an interesting arena that I think we're beginning to move into, which is as we understand more and more about the disease and the complexity and that there are actually many, many variations of Parkinson's, that it's not just one thing, that it may mean that we need a variety of, of treatments for Parkinson's A versus Parkinson's B. And along those lines, Andy Singleton, a number of people are raising questions about whether there's a genetic connection between um, the kind of Parkinson's 
that you have that may be genetically determined and specific symptoms. One person wants to know whether or not there's a role that genes play and whether or not you have tremor dominant Parkinson's uh, versus problems with gait. Someone else asks, what determines whether someone who has Parkinson's um, has a form that will have um, dementia to it? So do genes tell us something about the kind of, of dominant uh, symptoms that someone might have? Um, I suspect they will, but in truth, we don't know yet. So finding genes that are a risk factor for disease is it's a lot of work, but it's relatively straightforward because really all you need is a collection of people who have been diagnosed with disease and a, and a group of people who have been diagnosed without. When you start to try and um, figure out the genetics of progression or what symptoms appear or how long the disease will last, you need a group of patients who have been followed for many years who have you know, very standardized uh, clinical measures. And that becomes much more of a challenge, as you can imagine. You're not just collecting a, a one-off sample. You're collecting samples and you're collecting notes on patients for years and years and years. So we've really just started to dip our toe into this arena. So the PPMI study is, is one such study where patients are being followed longitudinally, and we're trying to see if there's a genetic determinant of the type of PD they get. Um, it's certainly something we're trying to do, but we don't know the answer. We don't know the answer yet. And, and Brian, um, uh, Andy just mentioned uh, PPMI, which is the FOX-sponsored uh, study looking for different markers that would lead to early detection. And some of that early effort has found that in the, the spinal fluid, the fluid that bathes the brain, that there is a difference in some of one potential marker, which is this alpha-synuclein, um, and that there's that, and there's a connection between how much of that is in the spinal fluid, and whether or not you have a form of Parkinson's that's more oriented towards problems with tremor or problems with gait. So we're we're beginning to find a few things out that may tell us more. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, so I think some of the initial results, and I, and I believe that paper um, actually just got published um, in the last month or so. But uh, yeah, starting to really tease apart um, some of these biological measures in, in, in sort of the body fluids of people with, with disease uh, and showing that maybe we can sort of tease some of these out. And so I think that, you know, the particular example you're talking about is, you know, looking at levels of uh, the alpha synuclein protein and some other uh, various proteins in, in spinal fluid of people with Parkinson's and starting to show that there may be some differences in, in people with PD, including possibly differences in people with the different forms. Uh, you know, I think kind of getting at this broader question of, of what we'd like to call subtypes of Parkinson's, um, you know, I think it's interesting because I think, you know, for many, many years, and really since the earliest, earliest days of uh, when Parkinson's was first discovered uh, in people, is that we've really based all of our um, sort of observations on just what we see clinically in people. So they come into the clinic, they report a certain set of symptoms, and that sort of group of symptoms get categorized as a certain disease. And now with um, our greater understanding of genetics and sort of the underlying um, sort of, uh, you know, mechanisms that are at play, we're really starting to understand that there are multiple sort of flavors of, di of the same disease. Uh, well, you know, when you kind of look under the hood of the car, if you will, uh, even though it may look like the same car, uh, you know, on the lot, and when you actually look under and look at the engine, you realize that there are lots of differences. And so we're just really, I think, in the last 10 years able to start, you know, making those kinds of distinctions in Parkinson's. And I think that really ultimately will tell us a lot about, um, you know, ultimately how best to treat these people. There are a number of questions coming in, Elise, from people who just want to know whether or not they should get tested. Um, uh, so let me read a couple of to you and ask you to respond. Mm -hmm. Brittany writes in, my dad uh, had Parkinson's and his younger brother has it. At what age can I be tested for the gene? So a specific question about what, what age one could be tested at. And Marilyn mm -hmm. writes, uh, both my husband and I have Parkinson's. Um, how do we know if our children are going to develop Parkinson's. So a lot of very practical concerns about who, mm -hmm. who and when should you get tested and, and what do you know about the odds of this uh, being passed on to one's children? Okay. I mean, I, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in this, absolutely, because as more about the genetics of Parkinsonism is becoming um, known and then genetic testing is becoming uh, more widely known as well. People want to know, 
you know, what can testing offer me? So, um, you know, looking at the family histories, I think, you know, everyone has the right to learn their genetic information. And um, what you should take into account is that for genetic testing that's currently available, there's two types. There's clinical testing that's ordered through your physician for the rare causal genes and then some of the susceptibility genes. And then there's also the direct-to-consumer testing that's ordered directly from a lab. Um, and that has more of the susceptibility genes. Now, the type of testing that we would be um, kind of considering is, um, you know, looking at these family histories, it doesn't give us any of the risk factors that we would see um, for the, the rare causal genes. So those risk factors typically have a strong family history where you might see three or more relatives who have Parkinson's disease and two successive generations and be closely related to each other, one of those individuals. You might also see an earlier age of onset, or then there could be risk factors such as ancestry that might make someone more uh, likely to also carry one of those genes. Now what you can do is if, if those, the, that's the testing that's available and that doesn't seem like you would likely test positive, or identify one of those genes as the cause of the Parkinson's disease in your family, you can take a family history and see who exactly has had the Parkinson's disease in your family, how closely you're related to them, and then make estimates off of what we call our empiric estimates. So they have uh, good numbers for when you have a first degree relative with Parkinson's disease, what then is your risk? And that's typically around um, two and a half to three and a half times increased risk which correlates to around a 3 to 7% lifetime chance. So in the first case, uh, the, you said Brittany, her father had Parkinson's disease. So having a first degree relative would have a 3 to 7% chance. Now we don't have great ways to estimate when there's more relatives in the family who also have Parkinson's disease. Now uh, her, her uncle also had Parkinson's disease, so her lifetime chance is going to be increased because there's more of those shared genetic factors in there, but we can't exactly give a great number of what her chance would be. And, and Elise, then, is it also important to um, ask yourself certain questions before you get genetically tested? For example, um, how am I going to feel if I get this information, or um, how will other people in my family feel if if I get this information? In other words, are there, are there things that you ought to ask yourself that have to do with, with one's comfort level, I guess, in receiving this kind of information? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that's a wonderful point you make. So, um, you know, sometimes doctors order tests and then you talk about the test once the results arrive. And with genetic testing, it's very much that it's beneficial to talk about what the results would mean for you before the testing is ordered. And so that's important in both the clinical setting and the direct-to-consumer testing. So you want to think uh, through what it would be like to have a positive result, what it would be like to have a negative result, how you might share that information with your relatives because this could have implications for them as well, um, how you would um, manage uh, to work that information then into your life. Great, um, and, and we'll come back to some of these more specific questions. Please pose as many as you'd like, and, and we'll try to provide as much many answers as we can. But let's get to a couple of other topics. Uh, Kent writes in, um, where is research going to tie environmental factors with genetics? Is there research looking at environmental influences? This gets us to the old adage, um, Andy Singleton, that, that uh, you know, genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the per trigger. In other words, there's, there are combinations of factors. Um, this has been thought about, discussed for a long time. Do we have any under greater understanding of whether or not someone who has a genetic variation uh, that, uh, that, that might lead more to disease really needs to stay away from a particular environmental factor. Do we know more about the specific combinations that might be in play? We, we don't really, to be honest. You know, the, the genome is, is very big and difficult to study, but the environment is absolutely massive, and there's almost an infinite number of combinations of things you can be exposed to. And so it's 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 very difficult thing to um, to study. The other difficult part with 
the environment is that association doesn't necessarily imply causation. So you may see an association between an exposure to, you know, a toxin or a pesticide or something like that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it that it um, causes the disease. So, that, so understanding the environment's been a, a real challenge. My view, and you know, it's certainly not the only view. I'm, I have a somewhat biased view being a, a geneticist is that we can use the baseline of our genetic knowledge to, to try and get an end to the environment. So if we can understand how genetic changes that increase your risk for disease impact how our cells function, and we can see the same impact from an environmental influence, then it might make sense to say this environmental influence is something you should stay away from. But, but we're not at that stage yet. And, and Brian, can you add to that from the, and respond to this question from Suzanne, who writes, um, are there recommended ways to protect yourself proactively from environmental exposures that might interact with genetics to trigger Parkinson's? So it's, a, it's a going to the same question that, that Andy was just talking about. I, do we, and this question of whether it's actually causing it or it's just an association, do we know enough to say, you know, don't put pesticides on your lawn or, or whatever? Mm -hmm. Or are there, is that still such a, still, still really a gray area? I think, I think, yeah, it's still a gray area in the sense that we don't have definitive proof that pesticides, you know, will cause your Parkinson's. I think there's, you know, certainly lot, lots of as Andy said, sort of uh, associated links between the two. You know, I guess, you know, probably like anything, if you're going to be using uh, chemicals that have the potential to be harmful uh, to your health, you know, just use good practical um, sort of care when you're using them. So, you know, make sure you're wearing some kind of protective, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, face mask or something like that and don't, you know, just sort of spray it, you know, uh, without sort of... Um, you know, taking those kinds of precautions. So, so uh, again, we can't offer a, a definitive statement that um, you, you know, staying away from X, Y, and Z will prevent your Parkinson's. But, you know, at least what these um, studies do point to is at least certain types of exposures that we should be, I think, at least more aware of. And here's a question from J.M. who writes, are there really only five genes identified related to Parkinson's? And that refers to one of our earlier slides, Andy Singleton, that listed LERC2 and alpha-synuclein and uh, uh, pink and Parkin, and, and, but, but there, there are actually a number more. Bring us up to date on how many genes now are, or gene mutations are associated with Parkinson's. Yeah, so it, it, that's a that's a somewhat difficult question to answer. It depends how you define Parkinson's disease. So if you define it as you know the the clinical entity, how you see someone presenting, then there are a larger number of causative genes where a mutation causes the disease. We're probably up to somewhere in the region of eight or eight or nine now. If you think about um, risk uh, factors for disease, genetic risk factors, then we've localized around 28 of those now. So these are things that increase your risk by a, a, a small amount. So there's, there's a, we're learning quite a lot about the genetics of the disease. And a question from uh, Brenda, an interesting one about how much we really know about these percentages. Brenda writes, um, how is that one to 4% for LARC2 determined? Um, my mother, for example, has not been tested for a mutation. And I wonder how many other Parkinson's uh, uh, patients have not been tested. So could the percentages be skewed? It's a really interesting question. Uh, Andy, can you, can you take that on about how much we know and how much we don't know? Yeah, I would say that I, th I think we have a fairly good handle, but it's an approximation. And it's a, you know, I think it's a very smart observation that uh, this number could be skewed because the people that tend to take part in genetic studies tend to have more of a family history. So perhaps there's an over-representation of mutations in, in the uh, populations that we look at. But I think 1% to 4% is, a, is a, a pretty good approximation. Um, there have been a number of studies looking at the more common mutations in what we would call a population-based cohort or a clinic-based cohort. So this is essentially everybody in a population is typed for the mutation or every patient that comes into a clinic um, uh, is typed for the mutation. So this gives you a kind of a more accurate estimation, but I think 1% to 4% is pretty reasonable.
Um, Elise, here's a question from Asfa who asks, um, are there any numbers indicating that more people of a certain race or from a certain part of the world are affected? Um, as far as affected with, um, so I, maybe this relates to what I mentioned earlier. So when we're talking about who would be, um, who genetic testing might be considered, and um, I mentioned that people have a higher risk for a condition because of ancestry. So particularly how it relates to LARC2 in that context, we know that individuals who have an Ashkenazi Jewish background who are from the North African Arab Berber population are going to have a significantly increased chance to be carriers of these mutations. And do we know anything about, about race? As I understand it, Parkinson's is is uh, is pretty much an equal opportunity disease. There aren't a lot of, you know, n there's somewhat more men than women, right? But but it, what do we know about the sort of r race and ethnicity of, of people overall with Parkinson's? Um, I'm going to have to pass this question on because as far as I'm aware, I, I don't believe that there's any difference in race. Yeah, yeah as I, far I, as I think that's true. true. I'll let Andy actually answer it. He probably knows better. <laughs> yeah, as, as far as we know, there's no difference. Again, this is the kind of study that's really difficult to do um, properly and kind of gives you a minimal, minimal return on, on your investment. But um, we believe, as you say, it's an equal opportunist and uh, most races are, are equally affected. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, this may be a different way. Go ahead, Sorry, just, this may be a different way of, this may be a slightly different way of answering that question. I, I do my sense, and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there might be some distinctions, uh, at least in the genetics, that might lead to Parkinson's between sort of broadly Caucasian groups and Asian groups. And I don't know if, if that, you know, again, whether that influences how many cases of Parkinson's occur in those, in those different ethnicities. It does at least point to possibly different types of um, triggers, I guess, for their Parkinson's. Although I should say that some of those mutations, even though they're different, are still in the same genes that we've been talking about on the call today. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. Here's a question from Patrice. Um, my grandmother has Alzheimer's. My mother has Parkinson's. Is there a relationship? Uh, can you have both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? Andy? Uh, yes, yes, you can. Uh, um, uh, there is also a disease which kind of sits in between the two diseases uh, called dementia with Lewy bodies where you get some features of, of Parkinson's disease and some features of Alzheimer's disease. What we know from a genetic perspective is that so far there doesn't seem to be much shared genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease and, and, and Parkinson's disease. So the same genetic risk factors that we've identified in, in PD do not seem to influence Alzheimer's disease and, and vice versa. And Andy, here's a question about um, whether there's a genetic connection for young onset. Um, and there is, right? So, so tell, us, tell us more about that. Yeah, so um, there is a genetic connection for young onset. In, in general, we tend to think of young onset Parkinson's disease as, as more simply genetic in nature. So um, we've been talking a lot about you know, multiple risk factors coming together to, to um, uh, impart risk for Parkinson's disease. For young onset disease, we believe that there's more of a component where a single genetic variant um, is is causative, and I'm talking about really young onset here, 20s and, and, and 30s. So we, so we view it as a more simple uh, genetic form of the disease. Question from Robert. Um, what guidelines are available to explain to your children um, who, are, who are reaching a child-rearing age? I think this would probably be someone who might have Parkinson's, who's kids are now thinking about becoming parents and want to be able to convey information at least about, about mm -hmm. the possibility of, of risk or what their children should think about before they themselves become parents. Are there, is that sort of information available that can give people kind of a basic sense of what the odds and risks are? Um, so you're, you're interested if there is resources that help parents talk about their diagnosis with their children? 
it's not clear to me, or, honestly, whether it's that or whether it's not. I have Parkinson's. My child is now a young adult thinking about becoming a parent, wonders what the odds are, that kind of information. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think that's a great question, and that's, you know, one of the frequent reasons people come in for genetic testing and genetic counseling is because they want to know, you know, what the risk is for their children. And, um, of course, again, this is kind of the same scenario. In the absence of a genetic test, your um, risk estimates are still going to be based on family history. Um, so in those types of scenarios, you could, you could give the children, um, your children, their chance that, you know, having a parent with Parkinson's disease would be around 5 to 7%. And then their chance to pass it on to their children would be typically about half of that. Now, um, for individuals who have um, one of the causative genes, there is a great wealth of information about family planning options. So if um, someone in the family who has Parkinson's disease found out that their Parkinson's disease was due to one of those rare causal genes, um, you can find out if there are ways um, that you want to have children but not pass the gene on. So there are ways that and um, guidelines for you to follow in those situations for family planning aspects. We just have a few minutes remaining, and so I want to ask um, each of you just uh, for some for some closing thoughts on on the importance of gaining a greater understanding. And, and Brian, let me start with you. Um, this has become much more of a focus for the Fox Foundation than it was a half a dozen years ago, and certainly more than it was when the foundation began. Um, how key, in your judgment, is it that we focus more on the genetic aspects of Parkinson's. Is it a, it, do you see it from the foundation's point of view as being a major focus for research? Yeah, you know, I think different ways to kind of answer that question, but I think obviously what genetics is pointing us to are sort of clear, kind of as we talked about before, clear biological mechanisms that we could actually target that may actually alter the disease course itself. And I think that, you know, from the foundation perspective, that it really is our ultimate goal is to develop uh, new treatments that can modify the disease course and ultimately even cure the disease uh, altogether. So for us, that's a, a really primary goal. And genetics has really provided a number of, um, uh, of targets, therapeutic targets we can go after in that regard. You know, I think it also for us is, um, you know, not only about finding the targets, but also finding um, and understanding the different types of people we, sh we can be treating. Uh, and I think genetics has also, um, you know, uh, helped us to understand the different types of Parkinson's disease that might exist out there and how that influences how we go about developing treatments and, and, and new drugs for those individuals. And so I think that's, you know, we've mentioned the Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative study, for example, and one thing we're, we're adding this year is actually a, a genetic component to that, to that study. So basically looking for people who have uh, some of these genetic forms of Parkinson's and, and in particular looking for people who have genetic, these genetic mutations who don't yet have Parkinson's because it's that group of people that are, are quote unquote sort of genetically at risk for Parkinson's that if we can uh, study those individuals, if we can understand some of the earliest signs that might be showing up in those individuals that might lead to Parkinson's, we might be able to push that sort of diagnosis um, line even earlier and then even have uh, uh, sort of more of a sort of a greater chance of potentially um, uh, slowing the disease down in those individuals. And so uh, that's kind of a real ultimate goal for us. And, and at least, in, you know, so, many of, so much of this in the end comes down to a very personal question about what I should do if I'm in a family situation where there does seem to be some familial connection to Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. People just want to get a, a broader understanding of, of the resources that are available and what the pros and cons of genetic testing are. Can you point mm -hmm. us towards um, that kind of resource uh, for people to just begin to get their arms around how they want to proceed with what is ultimately a, a very personal question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can ask your doctor for a referral to see if there's a geneticist or a genetic counselor that works in your network, or you can go to uh, the website of the National Society of Genetic Counselors. It's nsg.org. And they have a function where you can search for a genetic counselor in your area, and then you can search by specialty. So in this case, it would be neurogenetics, 
or adult care. Terrific. Um, and there's also more about this topic that you can find on, on the Fox Foundation website. And Andy, I want to ask you to just give us a last word, if you would, about um, you know, the, the, the promise of this field. We've talked a lot about the complexities, but, but close us out with a word about, about the promise and, and the, the excitement I know that you feel about where this field may take us and that it may lead us to getting that much closer to finding a solution for, for Parkinson's disease. Yeah, I think there's a, you know, I think that there's a lot of excitement in the field of genetics, not only for Parkinson's, but for, for many diseases, because we have so many more tools available now to understand the genetic basis of, of simple diseases and of, of complex diseases. But that's, that has to all be with an eye towards developing a treatment. So really the, the, the underlying reasons we do this work is to, to, to um, try and understand the processes that lead to disease. And I, I truly believe that uh, genetics will give us that foundation. Thank you so much. Thanks to, to Andy Singleton and Elise uh, uh, Bendick as well for, for their participation in our conversation. And I want to turn it back over to, uh, to Brian to, uh, to bring our session to a close. Great. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, uh, thanks to Andy and Elise. Uh, it was a great conversation today. And I hope uh, uh, all of those who uh, have li been listening in uh, learned something new. Um, so again, just thanks uh, to all of you for joining us today. So I, I know there were many, many questions that unfortunately we did not have time to answer, but um, uh, to try to do our best, what we'll be doing after this call is we'll be sending out a survey to all of you, uh, and you'll have a chance to uh, raise some of those questions that you, you would like uh, us to try to answer. Uh, and we will be trying to then post some uh, uh, of those answers online later in a blog post. So um, look out for that survey. Um, a couple of other notes. Um, our next Hot Topics webinar is going to be on October 30th, uh, and uh, we'll actually be discussing an interesting topic related to uh, ways that we can treat Parkinson's that move beyond the more traditional dopamine approaches that we use today. And so this will cover topics, in, uh, a whole range of topics from the role of exercise and the promise of exercise, as well as some, some potentially promising non-dopamine-based uh, drug approaches that we could be developing for Parkinson's. So, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, if you'd like more information about that webinar, uh, you can go to our website. And there's a web link, I believe, on the slide that you can, you can click on. Um, you can also uh, then register for that, for that webinar. Um, so at that, I will um, close the call. And again, thank everybody for uh, listening in and, and wish all of you a great week.